Hi, good morning everyone. I always get nervous standing on the stage actually, um, but it's the first morning session, I'm trying to bring some energy into the room. There are a few things I'm going to do. I'm not trying to, I'm going to teach you to suck eggs. Most of you are CX, who, who are CX practitioners here? Put up your hands, right? Who knows about CX? Yeah, right. So customer experience is one of those things, right? It's a very topical subject. It's a very topical thing. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, everyone has an opinion about it. It's like football. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone thinks they're a football manager. But in, in that sense, you kind of know the, the basic things. I've got to have 11 players. I need to play 4-4-2, 4-3-3, hear out whatever the pundits are saying and say it's more or less like that. But there's so many intricacies. So what I hope to share, and pretty much um, what has been said earlier, is to sort of share my wisdom as much as I can. I've been practicing CX for the last 25 years. I'm fairly passionate about uh, customer experience personally myself. Um, I designed my first customer journey in 2001 for anyone from RBS? No one. Right, well, thank you. But most people thought I was mad when I created a customer journey in 2001. They go, what is this? I say, it's a life cycle. It's about understanding the key, key areas of how your customers engage with your bank. And they went, uh, no, but there's no CRM in it. So, you know, <laughs> so that was 2001. But, you know, I believe in what I've been trying to do and been going on with this for the last 25 years. The last 10 years, um, it's not just about PwC. I spent the last 10 years running a software business. Uh, it's, it's a customer experience software business. It's called Response Tech. We sold it about 18 months ago. Uh, if you guys have heard of Qualtrics and Medallia, Response Tech one one the first CEM leaders, uh, predominantly focused on banking and in the uh, telco market. So it's the kind of guys that get real-time feedback, the real-time analytics and sentiment analysis. That's what we used to do. So I also know it from a tech perspective. I can share my experience there. I know it from a very metrics basis as well. So a lot of people talk about customer experience, but you've got to, be, you've got to take note that there's the metric side of it, be it MPS or be it uh, uh, satisfaction scores of some sort, you've got to take note of those things. Now, as you probably notice, I try not to use um, slides, but there are slides because everybody likes to look at slides as well. Okay, return on experience. Fairly trendy topic, right? And in every company, what do they listen to? They do technically listen to customers, but technically what do they listen to? Show me the money, right? Show me the money. I mean, it's, it's the truth. The good thing about CX is that it's now on the agenda, right? Almost all of your companies, all the clients that I've worked with, more or less, uh, at least in the last 10 years, all tend to have CX on their annual report. The chairman or chief exec, and experience is important, and therefore we need to change the customer experience. And you go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you go out, you know, whatever, in, whatever industries and whatever co companies that we interact with, and you go, why is the service still shit? You know? It and those of you who are young enough to remember the good old Marks and Spencer's service, uh, that was what I used to think. Great customer service, but we kind of gamed the system, right? Remember the Marks and Spencer service where if you bought the underwear, didn't quite like it, you just go back and you just send it back. No questions asked, right? And then nowadays, you go back, they go, sorry, man, can't change it, right? That, that's all changed suddenly, right? So customer, good customer experience has always existed, but it's just not continuing. But going back to the point of the wonga, the money part of it, that's what return on experience is trying to trying to shed light to in terms of, right, how do we bring the money side of it into the experience side of it? Because I think I had, I had a quick conversation with um, yourself early on this morning and, and um, talking about the return on experience and say, why is it important? It's important because all of you practitioners talk about it. All of you are trying your best as change agents to tell your executives or your colleagues or the senior people that make key decisions or even if your key decision to influence other key decisions, why it's important. So we talked about bringing in more customers, more lead generation, and potentially more revenue. But no one talks about that often enough and, and consistently enough, right? So we talk about better experience, we pat ourselves on the back, great service, smile on the face, but actually it is, it is about the return, it's about the wonga. Right, now, see that slide? Typical boring slide, okay? Yeah, 
engage customers, employees, get some insight. Yeah, wow, cool. Uh, do some activation, behavior adoption. I'm not going to preach you this stuff. You guys know this. This, if you've been practicing, if you're a CX practitioner, you kind of, you should be doing this, more or less. In theory, that is, you know, an amalgamation of aspects of ROX. However, I'm going to kind of make it, I'm going to base it down a bit more. Who is a mathematician here? Anyone? Okay, we got Emma, colleague of mine. But okay, I'm not, 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 not a deep math person because I struggle with my kids' homework as well. So when they ask me homework, I'm like, well, I, I, I excuse myself and say, look, in my days, it wasn't like this. I did quadratic equations, okay? It was pretty basic. So, return on experience. Sounds quite cool, right? Okay. Is a function of your customer score, your employee scores, revenue uplift, the cost of your initiatives. You do got to cost it out over a period of time. Okay, cool. You put a formula. So what? Right. Who collects... Uh, customer scores. Most of you? MPS-ish? Yeah? CSET, MPS, whatever scores? Okay, fine. I'm not going to dictate whether it should be this or that, but let's just say MPS is a going concern. Who does employee scores? Or they just give lip service. We do an employee survey once a year, and we just check out our pulse, our pulse survey and see how our employees... Oh, yeah, our employees are happy, you know? And they tend to do that after the bonus time of the year, right? But do we have actual employee metrics to sort of gauge? We got some? More or less, right? Now, then, this is the part, right? It's not, it's not magical here, here, right? All I'm sharing here is a little bit of wisdom and, and putting some thought process of what you kind of already do, but actually, it's done in different siloed areas. HR. Maybe the customer service stroke marketing or sales team, project team, usually central program team. So, hey, somebody goes, talking about a customer experience program, for example, and they go, well, what's the revenue uplift, guys? I don't know. Track your revenue uplift, because that's what every chief exec will, has always asked me. Right, okay, we do this program, okay. I said, look, hey, MPS has moved up 10 points, or 15 points. The next question I tend to normally get from my chief, the chief exec is uh, money. What's, show me, how much the uplift? What is the uplift in this thing? And you got to go back to the basics and say, look, but then to do the uplift, right, you need, past, you, got, you need past data. So you need to track your past data in terms of what was it last year. And even if you've never done it before, you got to aggregate and go, what, what was the baseline? Fix your baseline. And then show what the revenue uplift potentially was. But the key thing is, this part here. So this is the part, for those of you who have done customer experience maps, and you've done a heat map, for example, and the whole point of heat map is so that you kind of know where you're bleeding. So you've got bleeding areas, for example. If you have bleeding areas, the natural reaction for any organization is, yeah, how do I fix that stuff? Okay. And, and, and the, the basics of all of us will say, look, to fix that stuff, you kind of need the people stuff, the process stuff, and the tech stuff that goes in there. And yes, all of that together with this X thing can sort of drive that. Now, that initiative, so you go, what is an initiative, Mark? For example, if you take a telco and you take Vodafone and you know, the shops, for example, these initiatives are not rocket science, right? Now, you go to a telco shop, like a Vodafone or BT or whatever it is, you know, and the, the queues are you know, horrendous generally. And you're standing there, and you're waiting, and not, you're not getting, being served, right? Now, there can be initiatives in terms of queue management. There can be initiatives in somebody coming to you to sort of say, look, hey, how can I help you? Let me manage your expectations. It's a very simple thing. No different to what many other companies do. Those are initiatives. Now, to cost, the cost, what is the cost of doing that initiative? Now, even if you say, look, there's no cost in that, fine, you've got to put it down. But you track, if you're going to do 20 initiatives to cover these 20 ble bleeding points, you've got to cost it out. Because then you've got to outline in terms of that revenue uplift. And then you track it over a period of time. My suggestion is do it over a year, because that's what should you be your MPS score. Now, who knows the difference between top-down MPS and bottom-up MPS? 
Anybody heard that term before? Okay, let me go back. Do we know what MPS is? Apologies for stupid question. We do, right? Okay, net promoter score. And I know a lot of us, um, you know, have our views on MPS and say, is it the right metric? Is it the wrong metric? The, the main thing about MPS is that it's become quite industrial as a metric, sadly. But it's so simple that people are able to do sort of gauge something. Now, the basis of MPS is about advocacy. So if I were to, I don't, I don't know your name, Steve, um, what do you think of John Lewis? Reliable, reasonable value. Out of 10, what would you give? There you go. An advocate, right? Okay. And that's, that's, that is, that's the top-down MPS score. The guy on the street, regardless of whether you're a John Lewis shopper or not, the guy on the street, the person on the street, the lady on the street goes, yeah, I think uh, John Lewis, yeah, yeah. And I could ask the same thing. What you, what's your view of Shell? No, I'm not an energy person, by the way. So, so, but what's your view of Shell, for example? Okay, on a, t a scale of 1 to 10. There you go. Not neutral. Now, that's top down. That's the brand awareness. Okay? The next part is bottom up. That's the stuff. Who uses things like, um, or you, if you've used my, one of my software before, Response Tag or Medallia or Qualtrix? Who's used that before? Okay. BT? Qualtrix. Where are you? At Coots. So you use Qualtrix. Okay. So self service. Right? Then you measure across different points in a potential journey, right? Right, okay. And you're at Coots, what is your transfer, what is your MPS? Yeah. 74, okay. That's based on the Qualtrics service, correct? Okay, so quite high, right? Because, see that's the thing, that's really high. 74 for Coots, okay? Because the general, supposedly best practice for a blended, and I'll explain blended in a second, right, is about 40 to 50. That's first direct, has been leading the way, plus minus, okay? Um, but let's just say 74. And people, and this is, this is the misconception, people go, my MPS is like 80 man, 90 man. Yeah, okay, fine. Oh, well, all right, all right? Who's at BT? Anyone from BT? Right. <laughs> Sorry, man. Um, trying, to, trying to work with you guys for a long time. But anyway, I, ha I have the odd conversation and go, hey, what's your MPS? Oh, we're all right, man. Uh, um, Medallia says we're like, you know, 60. You know, like, yeah, you know? And so, like, so in that sense, from a transactional perspective, right, it seems quite good. What you've got to remember about transactional MPS, the bottom-up MPS, is that it also depends on where you collect your feedback at different points of that journey. So you have to design from being aware to buying, to servicing, to using, to potentially leaving as well. Track that thing, but also pick up. Now, those of you who work with things like MPS and CX, CX scores, where's the score? Which part of the journey is the happiest score? Got it. Why? I came up with my new 5G phone. I'm happy like hell. And hey, I just came out. And the sales MPS at retail generally is super high. All right. Now, where's the shitty score? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Take the flat. Exactly. So what happens in a boardroom? I see this all the time. All the time, chief exec sits there and like, well done sales, yeah, revenue uplift, brilliant, awesome, great revenue, it's flooded the market, MPS and satisfaction is awesome, and the guy is smug like hell, right? And customer service is going, yeah, but it's not fair, right? Because the guy, you know, it's like, you know, marketing ran that campaign, 20 gigabytes for 10 quid, right? But then they forget at retail, they forgot to mention it's only for three months. Okay, so, yeah, you know that one, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know that one. 
And then he come back three months later, it's like, why is my bill 39 pounds now? The guy said it was 20 quid. I swear he did. And this is why the MPS score goes down. Right? Not rocket science. Now, true MPS, therefore, is you've got to take transactional MPS, your John Lewis branded MPS, blend it. Okay, the market research in us, the market research people here would know how to do the math or the mathematicians in us will have to sort of blend that score. All right, come talk to me separately and I'll teach you the mathematical formulas to blend the scores. Because you have, you should, that's a true MPS and sort of get you a gauge of where it is. If you start only taking about word in the street, right, that's not quite accurate. Word on the street is unfair as well. Because if, for example, if BT, which is sponsoring, I think, the England team, yeah, right, correct? And let's say they blitz, they blitz for the Euro, is Euro 2020 this year? This year, right. So they blitz the ATL campaigns, your above the line campaigns, your ad campaigns, and they blitz it big time, BT, 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 every day, one month before the tournament, all right? And they blitz Harry Kane, BT, everywhere, whatever it is. And England win the Euro 2020. MPS will be 70, guaranteed. How do I know that? I did that. I did that for Orange. I made Orange sponsor Euro 2012. And, and that was to change the perception of what Orange was and push the MPS scores up there. The chief exec thought, hey, that's just a marketing, that's good enough. I said, no, mate, we've got to fix this part here because the transaction, the, the, the service at the shop, the service at the call centers, the service at the service engineers when the guy comes in, that needs to be continually going up. If not, your, your, your top-down MPS will be quite cool for about six months. And trust me, that's going to just hit the ground once that campaign's over because you've set such a high expectation. And again, I've not really talked through the slides. Um, okay. okay, this is quite a useful slide. Okay. Take pictures if you want to. Uh, happy to share the IP here. Formula. Everyone gets the formula? Yeah? Okay. But it's not so much the formula. It's about, I want you to understand that MPS score, right? What is the revenue uplift on the MPS score? And blended MPS score. Employee metrics, okay? Not just HR, right? Revenue uplift, cost of initiatives, one year, let's just say. So Mark, what do we need to do to kind of do that, right? So we kind of know that, that's that, okay, about a metrics perspective, you sort of shared your wisdom in terms of um, how, how to go through the political game internally within the company and speak the right language and get our, our, our other colleagues to sort of accept why CX is a key. If you keep on saying the return on experience, they'll think, wow, you guys know your stuff, man. Okay? But then you go, right, what do I need? What stuff do I need? And those, the experts that are here, yeah, we need the journey mapping. We might need the heat mapping thingy. Uh, we need some initiators thingy. So all this stuff that you kind of know, we need wow moments, moments that matter, all that stuff, the buzzwords that you've been using. Yes, you kind of do. What I just outlined here is just a very basic structure, a simple structure for everyone to sort of kind of get their heads around. And the reason is because over a period of time, in some shedding my experiences, a few people have asked me, so Mark, what do I need to do to drive CX? What, what kind of stuff, what kind of levers and things? You know, what, what is it? And, and then, you know, over time, I scratch my head and say, look, actually, there, there are potentially five levers. And yes, you can argue there can be another one, for example, but let's just say I kind of made it into a nice 5 by 30 things, just to keep it. But five levers. Being cut, what, is your, what is your structure? What is your governance? How do you operate CX? Measurement, as we just talked about, the most very crucial. And how do you communicate that? Within each of these potential levers, for example, there are potentially... Um, 25 components. Can be more. Can be more. They can be. I've been argued, people argue, say, hey, you, you forgot this. And I say, yeah, you're not wrong. So we take about our centric culture. If you're starting to run CX and you want to transform your organization, 
if you're doing a project, mate, then yeah, okay, do a project. That'll, that'll keep your job for the next six months, whatever, 12, whatever. But if you really believe, like me being stupid enough 20 years ago trying to do a CX journey and no one believes this thing. If you're really a believer in CX, then you've got to push the agenda that it needs to be transformational. And to be transformational, like any transformational program, it needs to bring in the Wonga. Okay? So if you're going to do that, what is the structure? That means you've got to start thinking about how do I form the structure, not for my, let's just do happy faces. No, let's think about how do we have cross-functional ownership as an example, right? What kind of, how, these initiatives, this, this whatever, queue management, how do we make people accountable, you know? So you see, some of these things that you look at it, what is our CX strategy? The CX strategy behind that needs to be the Wonga part, needs to be the happy part, but it needs to be also have that rigor of, of everyday continuity in terms of the process. And I'm not talking process, process maps. I'm not a big believer in process maps, but I'm just saying, look, at least have the level ones and level two so that people are clear what they need to do. We now live in this age, and I had a conversation about the agile method. And everyone goes, oh, what's agile? And I go, agile is technically a terminology for people who are not really structured and just go for meetings and go for a huddle and go, oh, we're agile. It's not quite, <laughs> okay? Agile methods is also about structure as well. But my point is, have, have a view of what your customer-centric structure should be, can be. Governance is quite key, right? You track it, employee targets. Believe it or not, when I run big CX transformation gigs, one of the biggest work streams I got to work on is employee KPIs. That's quite important, carrot and stick. I had a few chief eggs, I said. Yeah. For example, the easiest one is the employee MPS score. Okay? So, um, customer service center, BT, huge customer service center. And if you're using one of those CEM solutions, the customer experience management solutions, those customer experience management solutions, as much as it's catching feedback in real time and giving analytics in real time and giving you scores in real time, every score of those is technically appended to an agent or to a team or to a shop. Right. Now, if I ask you, how many of you have had a MPS KPI on your objectives? Yeah. Shit, right? Why? Can't control. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So when I used to run a software business and my chief executive said, oh, I'm a CX company. MPS score for you, mate. Mm, I can't control the MPS. So you start thinking about how you control your business as an MPS. So, you, so your question is that that, just simply by itself, we're not talking about you know, FHDs, etc. Yeah? Just talking about MPS as a metric per employee or per team. Because when you put that kind of score, exactly like that feeling, and I'm sharing my own, my own experience, it's kind of a shitty feeling because like, how do I control this? How do I manage my end-to-end? -end? How do I manage, because some of this is not my fault. So I therefore have to step outside my box and influence my other colleagues. That's quite key. Operating CX. I don't need to tell you these things. I think most of you know this stuff. Your journeys, your heat maps, right? Identify where, where you're bleeding, right? Channel alignment. We live in a world of digital stuff now. It's a digital world. And actually, technically, CX is quite easy. It's easier to deliver. <coughs> I had a conversation with you about car servicing. And uh, so what was your name again? Russell. And Russell, uh, quite cool, I never heard this example before. And he was talking about, he sends his car and they, you know, on servicing, and they send a video back of where the issues are. I think that's brilliant, right? Compared to me, I drive an Italian car uh, and I bring it there and 
and I go, hey, mate, the, uh, you know, the Bluetooth, eh, what do you expect? Italian car, yeah, you know. But driving good, yeah. Driving experience good. But I say, mate, the Bluetooth doesn't work. So, uh, welcome to Italian cars. Okay? Difference, you know. But that's, that's using digital technology to sort of curb certain things because we all service our cars. We all go in there, right? And next thing you go, you get a bill. And then we, the men, sadly, pretend that we know what we're talking about. So what is that about? And then go, the, the, the filibrator doesn't work. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, the thing doesn't work, yeah. Differentiator wheels didn't work. Okay, got to change that. Not that we know what we're talking about. But at least with the video, at least it sort of pinpoints us. And what. Simple things. Digital experience is a lot easier. And I think you were mentioning about the KLM experience. Those of us who fly at Heathrow, BA. BA uses a medallia system to track pulse surveys. What's your, uh, before you fly, what is the experience of BA? After you're flying, what's your experience? For? Well done for doing that. But what KLM does, for example, what I understand is, before you even fly, hey mate, your M25 uh, is going to have a major traffic jam. Get your bags, get going. That's kind of useful, right? right? For the travelers in us, we've we, so we got to rush. I mean, simple things like that. That's an initiative, by the way. I just went through a whole thing about uh, measurement. Okay? Feel free to ask me questions. Now, this thing, you can do all that stuff. But if you don't communicate internally, and if you don't communicate externally, duff, duff gig, completely duff. It, therefore, what does that mean? You do need a transformational gig. You do need to drive it as a transformational gig one way or the other. And that's where it gets the attention. And then the whole organization stands up to it. It's not just, it's, it's, it's a paragraph in the chief exec's report and the annual report as well. It's something that's different, it's transformational. Now. So then, therefore, before I conclude, you go, Mark, you talked a lot about transformational, uh, getting it into the agenda. Now, that goes back to, to, you know, I suppose, this thing. That's how you get it on the agenda for all your companies. You cannot just talk about, we are in 2020. You can't just talk about customer experience as though it's like football. We have an opinion, 4 3, three 4 two, 2 whatever it is. No, let's talk about revenue. The return on experience will equal this over a period of time. Last year's benchmark was this, and this year the target we believe will drive revenue this much. Okay, and here's the math. That's where people will stand up. And all that stuff in here, you can start to show where you're bleeding. Okay? For those who are wondering why those areas uh, kind of red and amber. Uh, that's actually a live slide I'm doing for a telco. That, you know, basically shared with me where they're bleeding as well. Okay? Um, so, I, I, that's other slides. Like I said, I'm not going to, you know, there you go, typical. Nah. This one, <laughs> I'm just trying to make it simple. So you say, look, all the 25 things, or the five things and 25 things, what would you do? I say, look, right. you know, if, you, if, if hand on heart, I'll say you do these things, right? It's nothing new. Establish what you want to do. Always create a segment. Always understand your customers. That is not new. Those are marketers and nurses who know what segmentation is about. Create that heat map. Create your initiatives prioritize their stuff, do a dragon's den in terms of things that needs to be done. And then this is actually a live slide of how you do cross-functional ownership of basically getting other, other people on the board to own something else that's not in their own function. I think with that, I will say thank you, but nice I would one. like precedence. Superb. Mark, if someone had told me that our first speaker today would start off by giving us a formula that went from one end of the screen to the other, I would have probably pulled a face. But the fact that you showed us that, and it actually made so much sense. I don't do maths, and I looked at that and thought, ah, I get this. That was great. I love the fact that you had employee experience in there right from the word go. You didn't tell us about employee experience as a, like an add-on extra. No. You, that's embedded, right, in the whole thing. Yeah. Do you think some businesses overlook that or skip that? So even in the formula here, regardless of whether it's super right or super wrong, right? 
sales and customer service, HR. HR don't. HR metrics do not track revenue. HR metrics, for example, track uh, people who are left, people who have joined, mm. and the reasons for joining. And they are at a stage where CX was maybe about 15 years ago of tracking an employee journey uh, and therefore saying, look, trying to make employers happier, cool place, all that mm. stuff. But they're not really tracking the metrics in terms of how will, these, how will a, a group of employees drive uh, the bottom line for a company. Right. right. Yeah. Right, I would like to know what questions that you folks have for Mark. So much there for us to work with. Um, if you Let me know what your question is. We'll get a mic to you. And when you get a mic, if you could let us know who you are and where you're from, that would be fantastic. Um, and then we can hear your perspectives, your questions for everything Mark's given us. Who wants to, who wants to kick off? Hello there. Oh, there we go. Hey, um, it's Libby from Octopus Investments. Um, I was wondering, well, I actually had two questions. So the first question was around measuring the revenue uplift. Like, how do you actually do that? And then also on the other side, how do you track it? Do you tend to uh, do like a segmentation piece where you'll A-B test? So you'll have one group that has the new customer experience um, initiative that you put in, and then the other group doesn't, and then you'll track what the results are? Or Okay, so um, good question. And... More or less, what the answer is, the, the answer is pretty much what you outline. The only difference, yes, you do take a, a group of customers, a segment. However, I wouldn't go down into that level of, of A, B, you know, in terms of market research. Uh, what we tend to do is sort of say, look, okay, who shops with you? So if you take your typical, if you take a telco example, there are different types of customers, right? So you, you break it down B to C, B to B, for example, and you break down B to C, for example, you got legards. Uh, you've got mobile centrics, you've got digital experts, etc. whatever the terminologies can be. Now, you then look at those groups, right, and say, look, okay, the initiators that we put in for that kind of group, and you can test it for the first pilot that you do, and you can therefore see what was the revenue then, what's the revenue here based on these initiatives. And you, the, the cost of the initiators, you can do that anyway, because you have to justify whatever projects that you do internally, you have to justify your projects internally in terms of the cost of that project or program. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. And then in terms of the revenue uplift of like calculating it before the initiative, do you usually what you do is you put in the initiative and measure like for a small pilot and then work out the whole organization. Yeah. So the small yeah. pilot, you're right. Okay. Always kickstart with a, I won't say a pilot, kickstart with a small group, a sample, right? The sample therefore proves initiative A, B, or C will work. Okay. And it will also outline potentially, it will definitely work, it will also outline the, the uplift of whatever you're going to do. And then once you do that, the, the, the business case experts that work with you are able to extrapolate that and sort of look at that over the next one year, two years and three years in terms of a return on investment. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. What other questions do we have for, uh, for Mark? Who's a, who that? I see a hand over there, hello. There we go, Ajay's got a mic for you. Um, for all account, Highways England, um, we're interested in the customer experience. However, we don't have a bottom line. We're sort of like non-profit. So what metrics can we measure to see, to see what the return on intro, um, investment in customer experience is? Okay. Um, if, if you, you're right. At Highways England, your interactions tend to happen... Um, you know, two ways, right? One, one is when, when, when stuff really happens and, and you come into the rescue. Uh, two is actually managing the flow of that that nobody ever sees, right? Nobody ever, you know, kind of sees that. They only see the, the signs that happen over there. <laughs> so I think the baseline that you've got to do is sort of measure the transactional part of it first, okay? So before you start even looking at revenue uplift or, or, or for your, your, init your revenue, will be, I presume, uh, flow of traffic, uh, wait uh, uh, traffic jams. So you would use that as a basis, right? So if uh, jams were this much this last year, you know, by putting whatever initiative, those jams go down that way. So that is, that's basically your bottom, my, my assumption that's your bottom dollar. Now, if you're not already measuring that, then the very basics is go back to basics and say, look, can I measure uh, at least the interaction point. So when you have your highways 
uh, you know, guy going into the thing and helping out whatever it is, can they be measured in real time? So as, as, as anything, you sort of measure the services that you're trying to do. It's a bit of a different one, but I think you go back to the basics first on that one, I think. Sorry. Not, not, not the usual example, but I think it's, it's, it's a good one. Though. No, but useful. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who else has something for Mark there, or all that stuff he gave us? I see a hand there. Rosie has a mic for you. Hello, uh, Rob from uh, Barclays. Um, so going to that presentation, am I assuming that you're assuming it's in the retail space? So when you speak customers, you think kind of you, me, on the street, going into to shops or whatever. What about the corporate space? So I work in the corporate client experience team, and our clients and customers are massive corporations. Can you apply the same kind of techniques, research, to get the research and uh, the the return on experience in the corporate client environment, or is there something radically different that we might be missing from what you've spoken about today? Great question. I was, I was waiting for that. Much of this is B2C, yeah? Now, a lot of people don't do B2B CX. What I've just outlined there is not radically different for B2B. It's pretty much more or less the same. There's some differences. So when you, for example, for those who work in the B2B space, right? When you map out your customer journey, now a typical customer journey, um, schematically, for example, like that, right? Schematically, something like that. You know, from being aware to, that's actually a B2B example, by the way. So from here to there, right? When you map that out, traditionally on a B2B side, you outline your customer needs, okay? B2C customer needs. And in a B2C context, that customer journey, 70% of those boxes, those needs, need to be emotional, very EQ-based, very emotional needs. I need to do something. I need, so you need to predict what a customer, that segment would do. I need to do certain things. Then 30% of that will be rational. What is rational, Mark? Rational needs are basically the business-centric part of it. That means I need to submit, submit whatever. I need to send, I need to sign. These are rational needs that a, cu a customer knows I'm engaging with a corporation, so I need to do some rational things. Now, on a B2B context, that thing here is reversed. 60 to 70% of those needs are rational. 30% of those are emotional. What does that mean? So the rational needs, you start going back into some of those needs, and that journey is very much into account management, right? So you talk about a lot of these things. So it's not just the account management sales process. What is the account management? So as you outline this, if you do a typical account management process, it just sits in sales. But if you do a customer journey across a period of time, that end-to-end -end for B2B, it needs to be rational. That outlines a good percentage of, of, of account management processes. And then when you do that, okay, and even in B2B, you still have service and support, right? All the things are still the same. But you start to outline a lot of these in terms of the, of the heat map, in terms of whether it's good or bad. And then the initiatives are still the same, okay? And the quantification of those initiatives are still the same because whatever you would like account management function A or team A for this large corporation, or small Soho, small office, home office kind of companies, you would do the same thing as well, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. But. Brilliant. Well, that was a great question, I think, just to finish this little part of it. There's so much there for us to think on. We're going to be circulating uh, Mark's presentation along with the others after the event. So if you're still digesting what Mark's offered us there, still working it through, there's be plenty of other opportunities. And Mark, are you sticking around for the break time or do you need to head off? What, what time's break? Um, in, uh, it's 10.45, we're going to take a break. Okay, I've, I've got a shoot. I have a colleague of mine here, Emma. Um, she's absolutely brilliant. Where's Emma? Wait, better, Emma. Over there. Emma. Yeah, she's smarter than me, so if you need anything. <laughs> um, but uh, I've got a shoe because I have been told. So any really tricky questions we were going to ping at you, we're to ping at me. Um, go for Emma instead, yeah. I think, Rosie, you got my details. Feel free to, you know, honestly, feel free to call me. Uh, I'm not selling anything, but honestly, just feel free to call me anytime. Uh, this is all about shedding wisdom and happy to sure. share wisdom to, to a, a group of people who believe in CX. Okay. Well, that was such a good start to the day. Thank you so much. Brilliant.